Welcome back to Live With, brought to you by Species Nutrition. Visit speciesnutrition.com. I'm Dave Palumbo, and today's guest is known as the mad scientist, my good friend from years past, Amina Lai. Welcome to the show. How are you? Great to hear from you again, Dave. Hey, now um, we knew each other back in the 90s, back when I was uh, very big and beefy and competing and uh, going up against guys like Craig Titus and Don Long and King Kamali and the whole crew. And uh, you were uh, one of the original gurus back then, as we called them. Uh, you might have been the first guru. I don't know. They, I, I don't think I ever heard the term guru until you actually came on the scene. I get there was no there was no term for what uh what I did back then. I think it was just, you know, the guy you came to to get advice from the gym and then it evolved into coaching and guruing and stuff like that. I never called myself a guru, but other people did, you know. Yeah, now, how, did, how did you get like, uh, hook up with guys like Titus and, and Don and, and King and, and these guys in order to even work with them at all? Like how did that introduction happen? Because people don't realize in the 90s, there was really no internet. People weren't communicating that way. It was kind of like if you met someone at a show, that's how you kind of got in touch with them, you know? Um, well, Don Long was at the 92 Grand Prix that I did. It was a week after my 19th birthday. I, I did it as a lightweight. And my condition was exceptional. I won the novice and the open class. And when it get uh, David Lieberman, the brawl. <laughs> Dave Lieberman. <laughs> Uh, Lieberman was the heavyweight. He won the whole show, but I, I you know, I held, I held my own as good as any lightweight could have for uh, a teenager. Uh, I went, my condition was in, was really extreme, uh, regardless of the fact that I was young. But the fact that I was young had a lot to do with it. Don Long trained at my gym, which was Ironworks at the time. I worked out between Ironworks and Olympus, and you know, basically, he said he was doing the, the Junior Nationals, and he wanted to know what I did to get myself looking like, you know, I did. And I, you know, that was the first person. Um, my brother was the, you, you know my brother. A dean, he, yeah. Um, I coached him, and um, as a result of a dean meeting Kamali at Kamali's at a Deansburg show, which was the teenage AAU Mr. DC, Kamali then uh, won another show, but then came back to me and asked me for help for the collegiate nationals. Kamali looked so impressive at the Collegiate Nationals that uh, Craig Titus was there training the heavyweight uh, at the show, uh, thought that his guy was going to win the show, and when I bumped into Craig Titus, I asked him what he was doing at the Collegiate Nationals because, you know, he's a top-level uh, bodybuilder, uh, national-level bodybuilder. I didn't see why he would be at a show like that. And he said he was training the heavyweight, going to win the whole show. And I kind of smirked. You got to understand, I'm, I'm pretty young. I think I was 20 years old. I smirked at him and I said, I guess you weren't in waves because your, your guy's not winning the show. And then, he, and then he sat next to me. He sat right behind me at, at, uh, at pre-judging. And uh, Kamali and I had this whole thing set up for months on how he was going to walk on stage. We we're going to set the image from this point forward. You're going to be the Terminator. And it's going to carry with you on until you're a pro. There was a lot of you know coaching, psychological coaching involved in it. And so when he walked on the stage, when most people would walk on, you know, just like they walk on, he walked on like a robot. And, and that kind of threw everyone <laughs> off. And from that point, when he turned around to the back, before uh, Craig had even seen his guy, because Kamali was a light heavy, Craig literally pushed his cousin, who was in the seat next to me, out of the seat, jumped over the seat, and then asked me how much I would charge him to fly to Houston next week and help him get ready for the Nationals. He wanted to look like that. That's what he said. Uh, that's a good story. I didn't know that story. Now, Kamali, uh, his calling card back then was he would get crazy fat in the off season, and then he would have to diet like 50 to 60 pounds of fat off to get in shape. What was the deal with that back then? Did he just like to eat, or what, was that a strategy? No, it wasn't a strategy. Well, I'll, I'll, let, let me back up. Initially, it was. He worked with a guy named James Bryant, who won the AAU Mr. DC, uh, and he was personal training people back then. And this is back when uh, Perillo was promoting cap tree. And if you remember, there was like a, a way to get calories in where, you know, back in the 90s, we weren't really talking about eating more than 1.4 grams of protein per body, you know, per pound yeah. of body weight. It wasn't a lot of protein in the diet. So he was trying to increase his calories any way he could. And 
part of his whole thinking was, you know, eat big and get big, big weights, which was true. But, you know, into it, it, a lot of aspects, I think, uh, and I don't, I don't, I don't know any way uh, negatively, uh, but you know, he had an, an amazing ability to eat food. Uh, the, the liter- I'm not kidding you. The, the morning after uh, the collegiate nationals, the morning after the collegiate nationals, he dieted for six months for that show and lost about 80 pounds. The morning <laughs> after that, he ate, I'm not kidding you, I'm dead serious, seven plates of food from IHOP. Seven full <laughs> plates of food. Now, I've been around big guys, Dave, you know, you can eat, Titus can eat, yeah. a lot of these guys can eat, but seven plates, I mean, you know, it's, it was unbelievable. Three of them were pancakes. That was nothing. He smashed that. It was an <laughs> ultimate uh, steak omelet. Smashed that. A steak and eggs stew. Smashed that. I mean, it was unbelievable how he could eat. It was crazy. So I think a lot of that is just uh, he mentally, you know, he also he he, he did have an athletic body, but he told me that you know he grew up kind of skinny, and so I think that a lot of his way, you know, when we a lot of times too, you know, Dave, when we were younger, they didn't. Think Dosages that people take now. So Kamali is trying to put it on side the way we know how, and that was with food. Unfortunately, he put quite a bit of fat on with it, and he did have to diet that off every year. And that was one of the reasons why uh, a lot of people kind of tended not to work with it younger. Yeah, yeah. Now, let me ask you this question. Um, obviously, Kamali had that great Terminator routine that he kind of did throughout his uh, career. Did you have anything to do with that? I'm sorry. What was that? The the Terminator routine that Kamali did, which was you know one of his yes. best routines. Would, we, did you ha- have anything to do with that? We choreographed it together. We practiced it together. Uh, a lot of people, Dave, don't know uh, about my ability to pose and, and how I help a lot of people with their posing. But I I, I kind of adapt to people's style. His style, which he wanted, and the, at the time, the Terminator was a was a blockbuster movie. Andy was out there, and you know, Vince Taylor was doing his. It, it, right at that time, Vince Taylor was very popular for doing his robotic move on at the stage. And Kamali said that he wanted to pose like that. So what I did was created a persona for him, and I I, I made him say, you know, from the minute you walk on the stage, you are Terminator. You have to do every move like that, and you know. And then th- this, of course, evolved into now he, he trains a lot of clients too. He he takes a lot of things that uh, he learned while we work together, and he's helping a lot of other people, and they're doing very well. Uh, he's very good at coaching people with their posing. It all started from he already had a natural ability to pose. So I don't I don't want right, to say right. that he's already very gifted. He was very good with posing to the music and stuff like that. When he met me, it was the icing on the cake. I let him know which pose to do with which what part of the presentable of the music. And then also the way that, you know, he never thought about walking on stage like that and turning like you're the Terminator when you're doing your compulsory. And I think that really took the judges by storm. They always remember from that moment in his condition, and it gave him a hit because he applied the ranks to the next level of Terminator Pro. Now, uh, Craig uh, Titus had a great bat routine to Batman. I remember that routine like, I mean, it was it was it was so impactful. Uh, uh, I thought I thought it was it was so well choreographed. Every ounce of the music and any he, he used that for many many years too. But I just thought it was great, especially when he was in the amateurs. I, I know you had something to do with that routine, correct? That's my routine. Actually, you can see that Adine. I actually. That was a routine that I was going to perform at my next competition. My brother competed before I did, before Titus competed. You can YouTube a Dean, A-D-I-N-A-L-A-I, and you'll see that Batman routine perform flawlessly, better than Titus did it, the way that it was designed, it was actually originally made for. Craig didn't do some original poses due to his body versus a Dean's body, but we modified the routine for him it was totally choreographed by me, every every part of it. Also, if you notice the big difference between when Craig competed against Dennis Newman uh, for the USA's and then after the years with his compulsory and yeah. the way that he had a little bit more stage flamboyance and presence uh, when he hit his compulsory, we worked quite a bit on that too. He, he was great. I got to tell you, he had great stage presence. Um, uh, that was you something know, that was impressive. I thought that... 
he commanded that stage, especially like right before he, those last two years that he was an amateur. He was excellent on stage. Yeah, you know, I got a, I got one thing about uh, Kamal Craig. Uh, it, it, I think they're both few basically created over the fact that neither one of them other before we all met at the Nationals, which is silly, but they were both extremely good few. Uh, they were great, like hard somebody trying to convince a training program to, to, to someone, you know, despite the personality differences, whatever, they're two totally different types of people. Kamal flawed execution when it came to diet. He, he was extremely, it was the point where I, I trust that I knew that if I put something on paper, I could actually calculate what weight would do because he was so consistent with everything. Hyde is also, I've made it a point for him to understand that it's all about the food. And you know, because the biggest thing Craig and Dave you know that everyone does, he took an excessive amount of drugs. I mean, it was ridiculous. I mean, you know, everybody knows this about Craig. And so when, when I met him, I had to really convince him that you're not utilizing about, about at least half a you know, I mean, we're talking about a guy that took 40 ML gel capsules in one day. 40. How, how many? I mean, 40, man. 40 Is Anadrols? Andriol. Oh, Andriol. Andriol. Oh, that's still a lot. But still, that's crazy. Yeah. Hold on. We lost, we lost the uh, I mean here. Hold on. We'll let him get his phone back. So wait, so give, give us a typical Craig Titus cycle before you started working with him. What was he taking? His, uh, his gear regimen? Yeah, his gear regimen. What was it? Oh man, it was it was man, it was grams of stuff. I mean, like when it came to testosterone, it was a, a cc of every type of testosterone you could put in the syringe for every day of the week. I mean, literally, you would take about six cc's of something every day. Every day? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I didn't know it that. Was, and he put it in everywhere. He put it in his in his calves, triceps, shoulders, chest. I mean, he, he injected himself in places that, you know, as, as a nurse, you know, we, we're not supposed to do, but he did it. <laughs> now, when you started working with him, was, was he still going crazy with the amounts that he was using, or did he listen to you at all? He did listen to me. Um, you know, a lot of people don't know that Craig actually lived with me for a month. Um, before the national, and um, you know he had a he had a substance abuse problem at the time uh, with cocaine, and uh, he he said he needed to get away from Houston. He was dating Debbie Halo at the time. Mm. She moved all his stuff to Venice Beach while he was getting ready for the nationals. He moved in with me for a month, getting ready for the nationals, and I had supervision over him 24/7 for a month. That made a huge difference for him. I was able to hear what took what. And he could clearly see some of the things that he was buying on weren't really going to make a difference for him. But then again, Dave, this is a, I think you remember where stuff like that injectable was available, uh, can of cream was available, yeah. and you know, DMS though, where you would rub it on the skin and you know get rid of some fat spot areas. Not like the gimmicks that people now, but the real. And so we used all those things to our advantage, and you know, unfortunately. Place as well as a bit of a uh, 94, but it was second. You know, as they say, it was the Mayo's turn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, talk to me a little bit about let, let, since you mentioned Craig and, and having a substance abuse problem. Um, were you first of all, what happened? How come you and Craig stopped working together at some point? Wow. No, nobody's asked me that. Um, he got in trouble. Uh, he got in trouble for selling ecstasy, and he went around the country and started trying to set up everybody he knew. Um, with that being said, I have friends that let me know what was happening, uh, friends that were in law enforcement, let's say, and uh, I ended our relationship before the damage could have been done. Gotcha. Okay, so you you would yeah, you, you don't want to be a victim of Craig's uh, trying to get himself out of trouble. Now, were you shocked uh, when you heard what happened to Craig? You know, with the Kelly Ryan thing, the whole you know drugs, and then the, the the killing, and and I mean, did that shock you, or did you did you see that coming? 
What was a shock to me was the fact that, I, and uh, listen, Dave, this might sound kind of bad, but I, I knew him on a personal level, okay? And I'm not, I, this, this is by no means is this me condoning his behavior, okay? So just clear, let's be clear about it. What really shocked me was the fact that he didn't get away with it. You know what I mean? He's a really <laughs> smart guy. I, 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 I sounds bad, guys, but seriously. So you have to understand, his brain was in such a bad place that he lost some of his intelligence. You know, yeah. first if he was intelligent, he would have done first place. So it lets you know that, that some kind, and from my understanding, he was uh, using uh, pharmaceutical pain medication and methamphetamine. I believe he was injecting an IV. These type of things cause psychosis. Right. And it's unfortunate for Craig because he, he and you know, Dave, wasn't he, wasn't he one of the most charismatic people ever? I mean, oh, honestly. yeah, he got people to follow him. I mean, he was he definitely was a, was a leader in that sense. Unfortunately, it was usually leading the wrong the, in the wrong direction, you know. Yeah, and I think I think a big part of that had to do with with you know his true nature changing because of substance. So you think his whole problem was drugs? Yeah, he had a drug problem basically. I totally think. Because I mean, you know, I mean, we can go back to, to even '94. Uh, I'm not not blaming anything, but you know, Nubain uh, was was a was a problem for him, mm -hmm. and he took that, you know, he shared that that which could be beneficial to some people or not. I don't want to argue about that right now, but but he told a lot of people about it. I think it caused a lot of people to have addiction. You know? Yeah, he, well, he caused me to have an addiction. <laughs> not that I, not that I'm blaming him or anything like that, but he definitely introduced me to it at, at some point. So uh, he liked his and, new bane, That's for sure. And I got to I got to apologize because I, I I introduced him to it. And I feel like I'm kind of the start of that whole negative new bane wave, but I didn't know any better. And I told him that he was supposed to stop taking it. So he threw yeah. the bottle in front of him like done. And then the next day, I looked in the trash, and the box gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, Nubain was was a very uh, fun drug for bodybuilders to use because it was a functional. It was a functional high, you, hope, you know. Yeah, you always wanted to know what was in the fanny pack, right? <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, everyone had a, a lot of a lot of bodybuilders in the '90s had that fanny pack. Believe me, yeah. uh, because of that. You know, let me uh, ask you another question uh, uh, because. Just recently, you know, I, I predicted uh, when, when Craig went to jail and then I heard OJ had gotten, gone to jail in Vegas, I said, I bet you Craig and, and OJ will become friends. And an article just came out when OJ was released that he had lost 100 pounds before he left prison, like the last, I guess, four months before he left. And it turns out that Craig Titus was doing his diet and was walking around the yard with him every day to, to, to get do exercise with him. Would, would, would that be a shocker for you, knowing Craig being attracted to, you know, celebrities? You know I got, I got honest with you, I was, I've been wondering, you know, I've been wondering what's going on with him. The last pictures that I saw of him, his head was shaved. Yeah. I, uh, I was kind of concerned that maybe he had to join the Aryan Brotherhood or something like that. <laughs> I, I think he just lost his hair. I mean, I don't think that had anything to do with it. I think he just was going bald. Yeah, I, something was that. I was just concerned though, because I know prison life is... is one of those things where you the, the, the grounding and him being able to associate with somebody of a different race in prison is is pretty huge. I mean, it's not uh, it's not something that's you know that usually anyone can just do. So as a result of that, you know, I was surprised that he was actually talking to OJ. But it, having him go to the group and having him having him train people. I think that's, you know, that's probably the way he's surviving in there. Yeah, I think so. I, I think that Craig is like on the celebrity status there. And I, I'm sure OJ was too. So, you know, it's, I think that that's how they got away with it. You know, they're like kind of like probably immune from all the different groups there in a sense. Let, yeah. let's, let's talk about what happened to you because you were training a lot of people and doing a lot of diets and then you kind of dropped off the scene for many years, maybe 15, 20 years. What, where have you been the last uh, 20 years? Well, you know, and it's really funny because now the things kind of come around a little bit full circle. But, um, you know, after, after helping Craig and I helped Don and I helped Kamali and they started doing really well, there really was no niche for gurus. There really wasn't, it wasn't like it is now where, you know, people can make a business, make a living out of it. 
you were helping people. You were it wasn't even like with you, Dave, where you could get into magazines or something like that. All before all that, it, it, pretty much somebody who had my skills was somebody that the bodybuilder wanted to keep as a secret weapon, didn't really want to discuss it because the things that I was talking about were cutting edge and they were the difference between the winners and the losers. Um, so, you know, after, after getting to a certain point in bodybuilding where I felt like, you know, I wasn't really gonna get the money that I wanted to, I was approached by an old client of my brother's who's a, a, a political consultant named Roger Stone, who's very famous, I think, known for uh, how, uh, how he made Trump president. And uh, again, and this is not about politics, this is just the facts. And he said, you know, how much are you making working with these bodybuilders? And I, you know, I, I threw out a number that was double what it was. <laughs> 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 and he said, you know what, I'll pay you more than that if you just help me and, and I think that you, you, you're, you're really intelligent and you can do a lot more than just working with bodybuilders. So I worked with Roger for a while, we were doing in gaming, we worked on a few uh, campaign. Uh, one of them was the Galasano campaign in New York. I, I worked with the Nair. And I got a taste of different sort of a life, a life that was outside of bodybuilding, but I never really lost my love for it. And then I, I think really what happened with me was, I still, I, during this time period, I still have guys like Tony Freeman. You remember seeing me at some of the shows. Um, I remember seeing you at the Arnold Classic when Tony came in third, when Dexter won, or uh -huh. Victor won. Remember? Yeah. That was in the hotel room, yeah. So I was still. But I didn't really help anybody else, and I wasn't trying to promote, you know, that I was a bodybuilding guru or anything, because I had a whole other source of income. I really couldn't move like with the. Well, as I started getting more and more to helping Roger and understanding what politics is really about, I gravitated away from it. I didn't really like it. I didn't mind training, but. It got to be a little bit more than just training him, and I was his travel aide and his assistant, and working with him, and you know, hearing the phone calls of stuff that you know nobody should really hear, and you know, it was just too much for me. So I was living in Miami at the time for years, and then I went to Northern California. I lived there for a while, um, and and I started, believe it or not, I started growing uh, medical marijuana for cancer patients. I believe it. I do believe it. It doesn't, it doesn't surprise me. I became actually very good at it. I was did you, you did it legally or illegally? Well, medical marijuana for uh, California dispensaries. So we had uh, patients' paperwork for all the plants that we grew. It wasn't gotcha. a gorilla operation. It was all being sold through ter as a caregiver. You know? Right. So it was legitimate. As legitimate as it can be without it being federally recognized. Gotcha. You know? And this is, of course, prior to any recreational stuff. We're talking the, the early 2000s around that. Okay. Uh, did that for a while and then decided when they started bringing back uh, classic physique, I said, you know, this is going in the right direction. They're finally doing something about bodybuilding. They're finally going back for the more aesthetic look, which is the look that I like. I like the look of Labrada, Picado. I like the aesthetic look. You know, like Sweeler, smaller. And it's maybe because I can't be like you, you know, but when I competed, I was a lightweight or a, a very light middleweight. Right. And that's where my shape looked its best. And so seeing class does he come back, I, you know, I, I really want to start coaching and helping people again because this is the type that I always wanted. I find it pleasing to the eye. Not that bodybuilding's not, but I think that with bodybuilding uh, and the fact that we have always been so extreme with what we do, uh, there people are putting an envelope where if somebody like me comes along and says, "Really, you go too high," it's it's they don't believe. Yeah. They, they they really want to believe that they have to take more stuff. Whereas club people, it seems like they're more concerned about their health too, and I think that because of that, I find that there's. Uh, a platform for somebody like me who discusses more about health. I mean, yes, we, we, we talk about a lot of other things too. You know, my knowledge is pretty in depth when it comes to urogenic. But first and foremost, it was always the food. 
and the, the, the train to be able to pull the food at the end if you wanted to bump it up a notch, how we could rotate. Well, that. I mean, your nickname was the mad scientist, so you obviously were, were very good with the drugs, too. I mean, that's really, <laughs> that's why but, most guys went but, to you at the time. But given that, you know, insulin was one of the things that I, I, I was known for, but even with insulin, the diet came first. The diet was what was the key to being able to take insulin right. right. Nowadays, it's superseded where they just take 120 grams of sugar and take a whole bunch of insulin and yeah. they hope it matches out, they don't go hypo. Right. My approach was totally different than that. I think actually, our, we have similar approaches. Yeah. And it made because um, we discussed it, but I'm yeah. not sure. Yeah. You know, but you also, I think, would agree that, that uh, taking insulin pre-workout and trying not to go hypo is, is pretty much like a very, very negative way of doing it, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, we sh I should get you on the insulin show with M Milos. It'll be the uh, Milos and me and you, but we could team up against Milos because Milos is of the other belief that you just right. bang he insulin and then... You spectrum, from yeah. my understanding. Yeah. Yeah. He, believes in, he believes in doing a pre-workout with sugar. Yeah. And I would like to hear his logic. His logic is you feed the insulin rather than vice versa, you know? He thinks you, you take insulin and then you just keep eating until, <laughs> until the insulin, you know, until you, you balance off the insulin you took. That's his, that's his philosophy. Drive in as much nutrients as possible. Do you, you think... Know, and then do you're, you just think chasing, you're just chasing not going hypo at course, that point. Of course, I know. I agree with you. Do you think yes. that all the, uh, the pharmaceuticals that guys are taking are what killed a lot of people in the 90s? I mean, we lost a lot of people that we knew from the Matt Duvall's, Eric Fromm's, uh, I mean, uh, this, I, there's so many people that died, I, I can't even think of them. Greg Kovacs, and, you know, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. I mean, do you think that that, that had anything to do with the deaths, or was it, was it substance abuse? Was it just poor genetics in the, as far as, you know, heart disease? I mean, what is your theory on the fact that we have lost a lot of people from the 90s? You know, I honestly have to think it's, it's, a, broad, it's a combination cross-section of there, are, there doubt there was quite a few people that we lost that was due to substance. We know, I mean, DeMeo was one of them. Yeah. There's quite a, and you know, with that being said, bodybuilding in itself can be taken to a point where it's abusive. Um, recently, there's been a couple of, I don't know exactly what they were attributed to, and I'm not going to speculate. However, I, from my understanding, both people were being instant, okay? It can also be misused, an overdose from that, just an overdose from an opiate. Um, so, you know, we have to take into consideration that the level of extreme extremity and the people who want to push the envelope, what they're willing to sacrifice and how much of their health and how much risk to their health are they willing to sacrifice. Some of the guys that are talking about got big really um, we don't know, with, with, with one, I'm not going to mention his name, but with one of them in particular, who I also knew, I, I do believe he had a genetic uh, heart issue. And so I, I think that some people who are predisposed to either diabetes or you know, stroke or heart attack, it tends to work when they had the need but on let me ask you this question. You've been uh, working with, or at least associated with, Dr. Tony Huge uh, over at EnhancedAthlete.com. And uh, would you say his use of drugs is extreme? <clears throat> I would. Yeah. But, I, but I, also, I also think that he serves a purpose in which he claims very clearly that is his intention. Yeah. And that is to experiment and to experiment and tell people what the results of those experiments are. I personally don't, don't follow that philosophy myself. However, for a lot of people that aren't willing to do some of the things and are, are maybe scared, it, it's definitely entertaining to watch the videos and to see you know, what results he can whatever experiments that one may or may not decide to try on their own. And if they do, he's done some troubleshooting for that person so if they do decide to, hopefully they'll do it in a safer way. Do I think it's condoning usage? You know, they, it's really hard to say because the whole bodybuilding sport is kind of condoning in itself. So, I mean, you know, and it's, it's grown so much to, and guys, forgive me for saying this, but it's grown so much 
just by the nature of it, you're going to have morons in it. You're going to have more people that just generally have lower IQ. They're just dumber. They're going to cause issues for other people because they're going to take stuff from their you think to promote the event. And there's going to have some small following that's going to come along with that. Now, with that being said, that's just because the sport's growing. With that being said, really what we have to all think about, because it is an active sport, it's not a team sport. A lot of, there's a lot of teams that are involved, the team this, team that, whatever. But when it boils down to it, you're the one eating food, you're the one taking whatever, you're the one taking We have to take that responsibility of ourselves once we decide we're going to support a bodybuilding to determine whether we're going to listen to other people's advice or whether we're just going to, you know, experiment on our own or whether we're going to have any sort of backing for what we do. Last question. Um, DNP, too dangerous to use or do you, do you like it? I don't use it. I'm very lean. Uh, I've never used it. I don't condone it. The people that are using it, including when I did coach Tony, I asked him to get off of it for the time that I took. Now, Tony asked me to dial him in for shows, and I, I do what he asked, you know, because we're friends, and it's, it's, it's fine. Um, but a lot has to do with, you know, getting him on a strict program. The, my philosophy about DNP is, is, is this, and this basically has to do with the majority of fat burners in general. I think that if you focus on burning fat, then you're not building muscle and you're going to lose weight and you're going to burn fat. And if that's your goal and you want to drop a lot of weight really quick, that's fine. However, I think you would agree with me on that. If you can build lean muscle without water retention and without fat, that lean muscle acts like a catalyst to burn more fat. So I find DNP to be kind of counterproductive to bodybuilding because if you can't build muscle while you're on it, and I don't think you can build muscle while you're on it, then you can burn fat more by building muscle without it. All right. Well, I, I, I tend to think it's, it's one of the few substances I always tell people do not use. Very dangerous. The, the effective dosage of it and the toxic dosage of it are very close. That window is very too close for comfort in my book. And it's just something that people shouldn't use. People ask me about it all the time. But I know you don't recommend it, Dave, but how do you, I, I tell them, look, I don't even talk about it. I just, I just don't think it's, it's something that, you know, it should be off the table as far as I'm concerned. I have a approach. I have approach. You know, a lot of people, they, they want to, they ask me, you know, like, you know, I want to know how you recommend I take it. So that I recommend you don't take it. All right, last question before we go. Uh, I mean, uh, who, what physique in the open men's bodybuilding world do you think is uh, going to be the next Mr. Olympia? Wow. You know, if Phil Heath is not off, Phil Heath is not going to. However, there is something to say about him being on and Phil Heath. What do you think? What do you think is wrong with Big Rami's physique? Why? Why is he having trouble? You know, dialing in his conditioning. <clears throat> you know, like I get, I have a couple of guys from Kuwait that work with him at home. I'd like to actually find out a little bit more about doing, but I think it's a little bit hard. No, um, you know, I it's it's really hard. I think that his skin could be. I don't think it's actually hit it right or try at the same time. So maybe he's not really picking use of the mineral last minute. Uh, at the same time, too, we got to look into his brain. He is grainy in some areas, but he could be stride in more in other areas. With the philosophy, and I don't, I think you would agree with this, Dave, because your your growth, although it was tremendous, it was steady. It wasn't like out of nowhere you just got huge. Right. You were big and you kept getting, you know. So apparently he got very big, very quick. And from from my understanding. What ends up happening is, is that actual strength, the fiber, they end up becoming thicker, you know, almost like a keloid. And because of that, you lose the, but it blurs the, the definition, the striations and the fiber. If that's the case, then I don't know if he can get it back. It, it may be too late because the core of his foundation could already be blurred. If that's not a, then. You can go. You would think that high repetition training into failure with low carbs would do it. Well, we'll see. 
All right, I mean, thank you so much for taking time out of your day. Uh, you know, if people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way? Guru Amin Ali at gmail.com, at Guru Amin Ali and Guru Amin Ali .com. The G U R U A M E E N A L A I dot com. Well, thanks so much. Good reconnecting with you again. Thanks for all the great stories, and we'll, uh, we'll have to get you back on for a future show, maybe on Insulin with Milos. Awesome. Talk to you soon, Dave. All right. And that'll take us to the end of another episode of Live With, brought to you by Species Nutrition. I'm Dave Palumbo, and we'll see you next time.